IT before and after the internet and digital media. Can everyone hear me properly? Yeah. Uh, I am Jonas Mäkinen. I am from Finland, here representing Electronic Frontier Finland and uh, sort of the youth worker here, trying to get some young people along and trying to see how the views of young people and older or any age of internet users differ and why. And uh, the point of this workshop was to investigate and sort of list down the differences that we are aware of and the possibilities and perhaps problems that have came, come with the internet. We have a lot of people here who are early adopters of the internet. The internet, uh, well, the modern internet is about 25 years old. And uh, well, most of the technology is 40 years old, even older than that. And then there are some people who have started using internet just lately. Uh, internet is not just something that has happened in time, there is also a geographical viewpoint. You can't pick one single uh, time and say this is where internet came along because it's still happening around the world. New people starting to use this technology and in general other ICT, different digital media. So in the beginning I would just like to introduce by saying and pointing out something very obvious. There are different areas where, where I think and many think internet has revolutionized things. Uh, of course communications, that's what the internet is for. Business is something that uh, couldn't survive just like that without the internet. Internet has made possible perhaps demonstrations, revolutions, who knows. It might be just a tool. Let's talk about that. And uh, personally, my favorite education is also something that has greatly uh, benefited, has had large benefits from the Internet. Uh, as an example, I can tell you that uh, a month ago in Finland, uh, there were 20 to 30 mathematicians and we formed a group. We locked ourselves uh, for one weekend to a school and we wrote a first course book in mathematics over the weekend. It's free and openly available with Creative Commons license. Stuff like this would not have been possible before the internet. But we have uh, pan we have panelists here who represent well different backgrounds and different ages, and w we start by giving some time for intro introductions and let's see what sort of enlightened situations we find out. So if you could start from here. You take the microphone. <laughs> yes. And I'm very and I'm very interested in uh age, background, uh when did you first start using the internet? What do you think are the great things that or or bad things that internet has brought along? Uh, my name is Ashna. I'm representing the Collaboration and International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa. We are based in Uganda. Uh, personally, when did I start using the internet? Uh, that would have been in my A-levels, so hmm, quite recent. Sorry. A bit closer, please. Oh. Sorry. Okay. I'm trying to remember. Um, Yes, it's, it's definitely not more than 10 years. It's less than 10 years. Um, I won't speak about the internet from a personal perspective. I'll speak about it from my work-related perspective. Uh, to give you a background, I'll talk about Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania in an internet for democracy uh, viewpoint. Um, internet, yes, is new in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. It's not 25 years old. It's probably the same as old as I have had inter access to the internet. There are only 14 million internet users in Kenya, 5.9 in Tanzania, and uh, about 12 million in Uganda. Uh, these are countries that two of them don't have access to information uh, uh, bills, r acts or laws. Uganda has an access to information act, but it hasn't been operationalized. 
this was passed in 2005, but there are no uh, implementations around that. So with that background, what internet has enabled citizens of Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania, it has changed democracy and governance. Uh, these countries have uh, corruption, poor service delivery, and un uh, sorry, undemocratic processes. So through the internet, uh, citizens have been empowered. There's information being provided. Open data portals are available in Kenya and Uganda. So citizens are able to access information about government and sectors on the internet. Uh, they're also able to contact their leaders via the internet. Their parliamentary initiatives like You Speak in Uganda, where citizens uh, liaise with their members of parliament through mobile SMS or an internet portal that is incorporating social media. Um, in terms of election monitoring, which is obviously quite big in the region, uh, citizens are using Shahidi, a uh, web platform, to monitor elections and report election malpractice and a violation of human rights. Then to combat corruption and poor service delivery, there are also initiatives, internet-based initiatives, obviously, that uh, either monitor service delivery, report poor service delivery, report corruption, or just, you know, uh, express viewpoint on that to their leaders. Unfortunately, it hasn't been all great. Some things remain as they were before the internet. <laughs> that is, people are still marginalized. The poor, the, rur the rural poor, the women and the youth do not have access to the internet. So it's not something that's benefited them in the ways that I've mentioned. Uh, and access is still low. Like I mentioned, the figures there in the region, there are less than 30 million users and the population is a lot bigger than that. Um, it's expensive. It's, it's very expensive. And um, recently, governments have obviously found ways to limit access to the internet, be it anti-government uh, insurgencies or web insurgencies, I put that in quotes, or just don't have infrastructure, internet infrastructure in areas that are not economically uh, profitable for ISPs and for governments. Uh, an example would be in Uganda where um, in a recent anti-government protest, uh, the government ordered ISPs to shut down access to social media, that was Facebook and Twitter, for 24 hours because the opposition was um, mobilizing protesters through those channels. So yes, it's got good things and bad things. Thanks. All right. Uh, here I just want to say that after this introductory round, um, it's it's more than welcome that any of the people in the audience be like here in, in, in person or remotely somewhere do ask questions. I really want to leave time for that. And after the introductions, I, I do have some general questions for everyone. But yes, please, next one. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Deirdre Williams. I come from St. Lucia in the Caribbean. I'm 65 years old, which puts me between Vint Cerf and Tim Berners-Lee, chronologically speaking. So I suppose I'm the before, but I'm also the after. Please remember that I am here now, and I have attended the IGFs since Hyderabad in 2008. Uh, remotely last year in Nairobi. Background. Background, I will speak to you as a person because that is why I am here. I will speak to you as myself because I think the ordinary users of the internet are very often left out. So you can learn about me and how I look at this phenomenon and through me you should be able to see other people, ordinary people, not techie people, ordinary people. Okay, I remember rotary telephones that had four numbers. That's science fiction. When I was a little girl I read a lot of science fiction and there used to be stories about personal communication devices. These people had something all the time to talk to other people. And it was magic. If you were eight, nine, ten years old to think of that, well, the magic happened. My association with the internet began 20 years ago. 
1993, I was lucky enough to be studying at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign when something called Mosaic was launched. It was the first or one of the first web browsers. And just about that time, this strange person in, in Switzerland was doing something with something called the World Wide Web. We weren't too sure about the World Wide Web yet, but it was just being born. My original internet was a place which was rabidly non-commercial. It was like the Olympic Games used to be. You could not have a commercial connection. It was absolutely forbidden. That's something that has changed a great deal. The internet is now very commercial and so are the Olympic Games. Maybe it's a sign of the times. All right. Uses before the internet in the little island in the Caribbean where I live, news was a problem. We had television news coming in, but it all seemed to come from the same source. It was difficult to get alternative points of view. Information, that was difficult too. How do you find out about things? The encyclopedia is grand the year it's published, but it gets older and older and so does the information it contains. I believe you mentioned um, collaboration, working collaboratively. That was one of the magic things when I first, my first internet in St. Lucia was dial up UUP. Twice a day, the university in Puerto Rico exchanged mail with the university, with, um, I'm sorry, with the ISP in St. Was it even an ISP then? With the place in St. Lucia twice a day. And I could collaborate with somebody back in Illinois. I could send him a draft of a paper and he could cop write on it. And in the evening exchange of mail, I would get it back again. And this was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, the speed then you will all find very slow. Before any sort of internet it was even slower, but the early internet was pretty slow. You had time to think about what you were doing and what you were saying and things were not crisis all the time. It was a less visual world because photographs were more problematic. Somebody today was going around with a Polaroid camera. Um, back then you had a camera with a film in it and then you had to have the film developed and you had to wait and it was expensive and it took a long time and you didn't take many photographs because photographs themselves were expensive. Now my cell phone is full of them. All right, that's the befores. Afters. I'm not sure that I like being available all the time and unless I discipline this, I am available all the time, everywhere. Even in Azerbaijan, my husband could ring me up. Um, as a, an example of that, I was at the LACIGF in Bogota in Colombia um, last month, I think it was, and my sister found out I was there. My sister lives in Northern Ireland and she spent two days looking over my shoulder because the camera was behind me and listening to everything I said and saying things like, um, your hair's coming loose at the back, which is a bit disconcerting over 5,000 miles. Um, the speed is very fast. You press the button and it's gone and the other person has seen it and oops, I didn't really mean to say that at all. Um, that can be very difficult. It's much more vid uh, visual. You've got digital pictures. You've Taking a, a picture is, is nothing. You do it in a flash. You've got Skype. 
When my children were small, my mother lived in England and we had telephone calls. My, my then little boy would hold the telephone and not say a word at I don't know how many, how many dollars a minute. He was loving his granny, but his granny was completely unaware of his doing anything. For I have one granddaughter and she lives in Peru and we've been there all of her life. So when she met us for real, no problem. She knew us already. We'd been with her through chicken pox and um, measles and going to school and because of Skype, she could see us and hear us and great. Um, Facebook, I don't have a Facebook account and I'll tell you why. I have serious concerns about privacy and intellectual property as far as Facebook is concerned. And I don't like having to think about the politically correct way of communicating with my friends. And my friends, I feel, are deserving of small group or individual attention. I don't think Facebook does it that way. That's not my way. I choose not to do it. It makes me very unpopular. I, oh, you don't do Facebook. I'll have to send you an email. That's me. Is that enough? All right. I take it a bit more historical perspective, maybe. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, my name is John Kampfner. I am uh, now Google's external advisor on freedom of expression. I also advise the Global Network Initiative, which brings Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft, and now Facebook um, in contact with civil society, uh, academics, and others with regard to human rights. I uh, previously was, um, I ran Index on Censorship, the UK's main freedom of expression organization, and before that I was a journalist for more than 20 years, which puts me at the age of 49 in the um, middle upper echelons of the age bracket. Um, I'm old enough for my teenage daughter to use the terms um, BC and AC before computers and after computers. Um, and um, I'm the only person when I go into Google meetings I very ostentatiously don't take my laptop, I take my notebook and my pen um, just to make a point that um, you don't always have to look at your computer um, when you're at a meeting. Um, I talk to Google, I don't talk for Google and that's um, an important difference. Um, the aim is very much to ensure that um, within the realms of the possible freedom of expression issues are at the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, I am a pragmatist with regard to the internet. Um, I use it pretty much, oh sorry, I use it pretty much every moment of every day. I'm completely wired up unfortunately. Um, when I travel, which is pretty much all the time, um, there is nowhere I go where I'm not reachable all the time on my phone, on my computer, whatever else. Um, I don't regard that as an enormous encumbrance because I also think that when you're off duty you can switch things off. It's fairly simple. Um, uh, so I absolutely relish the convenience of um, uh, the digital economy um, and how that has transformed lives. Now with regard to the bigger question of has it transformed society, has it transformed behavior, um, greater minds than myself have, been, have looked at that for quite some time. Um, and I think the jury is out. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a foreign correspondent uh, in East Berlin when the wall came down um, and two years later I moved to Moscow for four years um, to watch the collapse of communism. In the 80s, uh, as an intern, um, I, uh, then it was for Reuters, I used to physically hand carry pieces of paper for dissidents uh, on planes um, as did all correspondents, pretty much diplomats, everybody else, and you would take them to your first destination, wherever you happen to be going to, um, and then give them to Reuters AP, whoever was doing it, Financial Times, New York Times, whoever, 
um, Der Spiegel, and uh, that was then transcribed and published. That's how you got information out in those days. Um, then came the facts. Um, the reason for saying that, apart from going down a sort of false nostalgia memory lane, which I have no intention of doing so, was to say to people who are politically engaged now, uh, wherever they may be, for whatever cause they may be espousing, um, to use technology, um, but not to be seduced by technology. Technology is a tool. Technology is a platform. Um, the web is a platform. It obviously, by a factor of X, it speeds up um, the, the, the passage, the transfer of communication. What it does not do is it does not change societies um, in the sense that it does not produce revolutions. It does not produce environmental movements. It does not produce anything. Um, uh, and the simple evidence for that was that in the times I was uh, a, a journalist, I, um, you know, I was witness to revolutions, several of them. I was also witness to terrible things, genocide in Rwanda, um, wars uh, um, not too far from here and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, and so those societal battles um, between authoritarians, between those trying to to change things and lots of variations in between um, continue to this day and they will not change. So um, I think that's my start for 10. Happy to uh, take, take any of these subjects on, um, but just to remember that when you look at the failed um, Green Revolution in Iran, when you look at the successful in the first stage, but who knows in the second stage, um, Arab Spring, when you look at um, uh, challenges uh, around the world, and not just in authoritarians, those that might have um, uh, been listening to me yesterday morning in, in an uh, interesting, I thought, human rights discussion here um, with Azeri NGOs, um, uh, will have heard this thought that the, the battle for um, human rights, for uh, civil liberties is not just one that is confined to authoritarian states. It, it takes place in every country um, around the world. But these, um, the measures for doing that, the measures for um, getting people involved, um, getting people to understand the practical, the pragmatic from um, the, the, the purely um, ideological, uh, in other words, just to get people to understand uh, what they can do, how they can achieve it, um, uh, is one that is carried as much offline as online, and that online is there to facilitate, but to facilitate as part of a wider society. Thank you. I get to start without any further introduction. So. Um, I want to thank you first, uh, John, for bringing up Germany and Russia. I'm born in 1987. I have no recollection of these events that you describe. And since I started being a member of the European Parliament, I keep getting struck with how many of my colleagues have very personal relationships to these huge and traumatic events that, that I know nothing of. Germany has always been one country for me in the map books. Uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia has always been two countries. I literally do not remember a time when this was not the case. And all of the information that I get about that is basically either anecdotes or kind of factual data. So I think that I've been talking to my colleagues at the European Parliament who were at in, in political trials at that time and also like this, the transformation of Spain in the 1970s, what it was like to live in the Frankist Spain when you had to look to the north to see what would it be like with information freedom there, and how do you perceive yourself in relation to Europe, and how do I perceive contrary to that myself in relation to Europe. Because for a very long time, like up until 2002, I believe the Berlin Wall fell down in the 1960s because I thought it was like this really past and distant event, and it took me a long time to realize that it, that it really wasn't. Um, but I think that the, 
what is common about the way that my generation now would be using communication to facilitate our protests and the protests that went on at that time um, is that technology definitely does not cancel out live interaction. It is still live interaction which is at the core of all societal change. And we very often forget that when we talk about things like blogging or Twitter or social media as tools. The, those basic truths like the importance of somebody being present during your, your trial when you're alone in the face of somebody with a lot of power, that still holds. Um, and whenever social media has been successfully kind of transforming a society, it's always because it's organized a lot of people physically. Um, but now then, the new model that we're having for protests appears at least to me to be very targeted at immediate, re immediate responses. So we have immediate responses in terms of that. Somebody will send out a call for protest on Twitter, and maybe the next again day there's 4,000 people protesting on the street. But it will not be a sustained thing. Like the Berlin Wall kind of falling down, this was actually relatively sustained. It built up over years and years, and then this culmination, and many, many years after that, during which people continued to interact. And this is maybe an interaction that I don't see as much in the protest movements, I don't know, like in the Arab Spring. And I've been thinking about that in terms of how we discuss these things in the European Parliament now, like how do we view these democratic tools? And we really lack kind of tools or even discussion devices to talk about the transientness of protests that are brought on by social media. Um, so I think that that would be, if I was going to uh, discuss something in relation to internet and social protests, it would be um, what are the opportunities for more sustained maybe activity around what you're doing in terms of societal change and also uh, maybe introspectively from from the European side because we discuss now a lot how we can use, how we can promote freedom of expression or democracy in other parts of the world through promoting the use of constructive use of information and communication technologies. Um, but if we react very strongly to uh, information broadcasts like in Iran where you very easily got the impression that maybe you know this was a revolution coming to, to Iran and actually it wasn't because the response that they were able to transmit through social media was probably much larger than what they were actually able to gather up domestically. And I think we need to think about that in Europe also, how we deal with this so that we don't get um, too hooked on the information flow, as it were. Uh, whenever you have lots of information, you also have lots of disinformation. And we're facing a huge challenge in how to tell those things apart, especially when it comes to bringing society changes. Um, so that would be my two starting points, I guess. Okay, thank you, Amelia. I'll have a very brief uh, in reintroduction for myself. Uh, I'm the youngest one in this panel, I'm 24. And uh, my internet usage was well, it, it happened in the early nine or mid 90s and I actually can't remember much of it uh, family had always had some computers and at one point internet came along and I remember when uh, a guy came into our house to install a modem and uh, then he for a test opened up a website of a, uh, of a video game producer from the United States and then my dad was worried if it costs a lot because it's a long distance call and and then when I sent my first email um, using Fedora, I think uh, there was the address bar, and it said it, it said just address. So I uh, input the street address, postal address of my friend, and I hit enter, and I thought it worked, but no, it didn't. There's been a lot to learn, and I don't think I am any sort of digital native. Uh, I, actually, I think there are many services, many technologies, many tools that are, I, I won't say way beyond me, but are something that I won't grasp totally, that I perhaps don't have interest in checking out, that 
that would take time for me to learn. There are many younger people who perhaps are so-called digitally natives, but last year in Nairobi, there was this, this there was this discussion on whether young people on the internet or people who, or, or young people who use ICT in general are digitally native or digitally naive, and this aroused quite a lot of discussion. And over the years, I've noticed that there are both of those, but it's not just young people. It's just not just old people. It's everywhere and everyone. It's sad to see, for example, that, uh, okay, let's take Finland, where I'm from, and uh, the use of computers, the use of technology in schools is common. We've done it a lot for a long time. But still, we have... Um, people we ha we have we have teenagers 16 and 17 who use computers a lot but it's just facebook so we 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 really have situations at times when uh, school kids should write an essay they want to do it with a computer but they can't find any program to do it with they where is it on facebook we actually have this problem it's really really not simple what people know how to use this stuff so even 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 people who are, who have born after the internet after all these computers they might be way off it's not that simple so uh if, and if there are any questions go go ahead and one how should he, uh, yeah use the microphone over there Uh, hello, my name is Łukasz Grajewski. I'm an activist from Poland, from Warsaw. Uh, I have one comment and one question. Uh, I have w one comment about what... I, sorry, can you, can you remind me your name? Amelia. Amelia, yeah. okay. I, I, I really liked what you say about the mm, stable follow-up of actions in Internet about uh, how how people react on 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 some kind of information uh, on Twitter on Facebook, because what I what I can observe is that we we live now with some kind of uh, like button effect that people, uh, for example, me and a lot of my friends want to uh, seeing this big energy about the internet and how uh, how about we can use this. We really uh, think that that that. It's it's quite simple to get the people attention and to and to make this uh, and to and to find this energy of people. But then people react only with clicking on like button and then that's it. That's it for them and they think that they are done with the thing and uh, to catch some some bigger attention about about how we can use internet. It's it's really really uh, it's really hard topic and. I think we still don't know how to use internet. We are, we still like in the fog looking for some answers. And here we we it's what for me is interesting. We should uh, we should uh, observe what, how business uh, how business works with internet. But uh, because because uh, uh, on some blogs about b how business how business uh, use internet, we can see how many money how many time uh, business use on for example some quite simple com campaigns on youtube or in facebook so we s i think on the beginning that there's still uh, the, there's some opinion then oh it's so such an easy thing to make something on facebook or put some tweet on 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 on, on, on twitter and have some and have some r thousands of 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 retweets but it's not so easy uh, so it's my it's my comment and my question to John about because you are a journalist you were a journalist what do you think about this uh, uh, the situation now about the news we have a lot a lot of news on Twitter uh, I, I'm really scared about this because I'm I'm looking on my on my Twitter I have some I have only uh, only 500 or or 600 people which I which I follow. And it's mm, hundred of news every second, every minute. And I think my my mind trying to to mm, I I I trying to mm, to uh, I'm trying to 
work with this with this system of news but i think that we have computers for about 20 years and, and our it's some kind of problems with our with our brains about uh, how how people uh, lived for a thousand of years and now during the 20 years it's changing so fast that for example a work of journalists changing so fast that maybe uh, m maybe in a 10 10 years uh, it w we will have no 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 journalism like we know from from the past so what is your opinion about about those kind of uses of usage of internet thank you okay john so apparently there was a worry that uh, actions have might become pretty superficial or passive with a lot of technology i'd like to also hear if this is more prevalent with old people or young people. I'd like to hear some comments on that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, both your um, your uh, comment on uh, Amelia's point and, and your question to me. Um, on, on the comment, uh, you're absolutely right. This uh, the, the danger, and Yevgeny Morozov in his book uh, pointed to it, and Rebecca McKinnon, uh, to in a slightly different way, pointed to it in, in her book. Uh, Morozov used the term slacktivism, um, which is, uh, I think, an interesting word. Other people have taken issue with that and, and also taken issue with his generally more cautious thesis um, about uh, cyber-utopianism when it comes to, um, to activism. But many people mistake signing petitions um, and clicking likes and following people um, as acts of solidarity, which they are to a in a small way. Um, with actually doing anything about things. Um, and change uh, usually takes place, rightly or wrongly, in the traditional forms. It takes place on the street, it takes place in parliaments, it takes place in the best sense in lobbying. You know, uh, the best NGOs are lobbying all the time. And these take place, like it or not, in face-to-face -face meetings and, and um, offline activity. That's not to sound a, a Luddite. It's not to say it's better or it's worse. I'm simply saying that's the reality, uh, in my opinion. Uh, as regards to uh, Twitter, I mean, I, I follow Twitter um, a, a huge amount. Um, John Kampfner, if anybody um, wants to um, follow. I use it um, in a very straightforward, possibly old-fashioned way. I, uh, I post things that I've written. I did a, an op-ed this morning in The Guardian and, and just put that up without comment. If you want to read my op-ed, go here. I might comment occasionally on what other people write. I am so categorically not interested in people's lives. You know, I cannot understand on Facebook or on Twitter, oh, I got up today and I had a nice walk or, oh, I couldn't, you know, I mean, who, who cares? If I'm interested, I'll talk to somebody. Now, that may be a generational thing, I don't know. But I'm so not interested, and also people going, oh, I love this thing that you did today, and oh, you look so wonderful, darling, on television, or whatever. You know, all that kind of stuff is just, to me, nonsense. Uh, but, so Twitter is a fantastic news aggregator. There are many other news aggregators, um, in the way I use it. Um, it does, for me, and that's the brilliance of the internet, it does, for me, what was very, very difficult to do before. Somebody would say, oh, there was a great piece in Le Monde, for example, or in uh, uh, whatever, you know, uh, a, a brilliant uh, newspaper in, in Argentina or something. Or did you hear this uh, radio program in Australia? And I mean, you know, how would you, you know, you'd physically have to go to your news agent and, you, you know, you might, if you're very lucky, if you live in a big capital, get it in four days' time. Or, you know, whatever. It was just impossible to find out. And now you can find out the most interesting things um, I tend to use mainstream sources, but international mainstream sources, the news, uh, civil society organizations, um, whatever else. So there is the massive benefit in that. There is nobody who is politically interested or engaged in Azerbaijan who cannot find out the latest moment of what's going on in the American presidential elections. I mean, that is phenomenal. In the old days, at best, you would have a transistor radio, you'd be listening to the World Service on shortwave or Voice of America or whatever. So it's all fantastic, that, that absolute provision of information, filtering it in the best sense. I don't mean filtering it in the, old, in, in the bad sense. Um, uh, being able to work out in everybody's busy days what's worth listening to, what's worth watching, what's worth reading, and what's not. 
is, is a great art form. But I think aggregators are, if you trust that aggregator, um, that sees itself as having a role in verification and authentication, whatever else. Um, you know, I, 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 think, uh, I think that's absolutely fascinating. There is a separate discussion around the decline in traditional journalism, which is precipitate and is going on all the time in terms of the decline of foreign correspondence, the, t the decline in investigative news. Um, most of that is purely economic. They cost a hell of a lot of money. News organizations don't have that money, the vast majority of them. That is an enormous problem because what social media at its worst and what blogging at its worst, and there are many good things I've just said, do is they just simply comment. It's just comment, comment, comment. And ultimately, for any society to be empowered, it's information you need. And to get information it takes time, it takes skill. Um, and so the decline in journalism, which is being replaced slightly by uh, investigative organizations, you know, there are, there are many in different, in different countries. So it may be a different way of doing it, um, but information to me is the key. Okay, Amelia has something to say, and then I'm going to pose a new question. So, um, I was thinking about slacktivism. So maybe the problem is actually for a large part, we don't have a lot of legitimacy in our decision-making processes. So the reason that you would choose to press like on Facebook instead of doing something is that very often you have the feeling that people feel, what does it matter if, if I do something? If I send a letter to my MEP, like what, what difference does it make? Um, if, I, if I try to affect something, what, what change does, does this have? Um, so, um, while I agree that change takes place in the face-to-face -face meetings and, and that we need to have the interaction part of activism, I can also see that um, y young people that I see in the United States or even in Europe, they don't, they don't have any hopes that they can actually make an impact even when they talk to me or if I talk to them they will actively be sarcastic towards me for trying to figure out if they have a position on, on the topic uh, because they are so detached from the kind of political institution that I am part of. Um, and at the same time, internet and distance communication makes it very easy for us to care about positive changes in other parts of the world. Like in the United States, there was this Joseph Kuna video, and I guess he's like, what, an African an African despot, and it's like, the, what can an American actually do to, to change any of this? He's just kind of a curiosity that comes and becomes this violent political impu impulse in the American society that nobody can really respond to, but it feels as if you're having a bigger impact with that because you get the media with you on this topic, and hopefully it will reverberate um, in Africa. And I think it's like the... the we have a p political problem also. Our political institutions are detached from people and they feel comfortable being detached from people. And the people feel kind of comfortable um, perpetuating that detachedness also. And I think social media hasn't actually been very successful in terms of connecting power holders with their population either. What you in fact see with Twitter or blogs is, is that people who are in influential positions like myself will use um, Twitter as, as broadcasting media. This is like where I inform people about the status of my work at some part of the day without expecting any feedback to come back fr from this process. Um, and I'm not sure if, if that would be something to discuss um, also, but I'm not actually entirely sure how to change this power dynamics between um, political institutions and, and, and electorates. I have a feeling that people could get a lot more involved with their public institutions and that the public institutions would eventually listen, but it's probably going to be really hard. And many of them are also global now, so that causes a further degree of detachment, which just m might might be very, very difficult to bridge, even with facilitated communications. Okay, well, obviously it is a bit of a separate problem for talking about what technology can do here. Um, but one point here could be that it has actually become easier to do something, distribute information or comment or, or maybe it's even like, it's, it's a, 
it it's more than nothing, but it's still something people can maybe do a bit easier than before. Uh, let's say a couple of questions and then a uh, short ones, please. Then I want to ask new things. Hello, um, my name is Martin. I am here with the Web of Tomorrow is Yours, uh, which is a uh, young people side event, even though I am older than at least two people on the plenary uh, over there. Um, I grew up in Germany. Uh, I, I noticed the fall of the wall in my youth. Um, so for me, there were a couple of changes that I actually very well uh, uh, participated in. Um, and uh, to me, how I used to recognize the internet in the beginning and in 96 is when I started using the internet um, with our instant messenger um, that I instantly got connected to very different parts of the world that I uh, before had no uh, influence to. Um, I started off uh, uh, on a very local level uh, in my own environment and then the internet basically connected me to the rest of the world. It increased my language proficiency, it boosted it massively. Um, I got aware of just that my kind of community I can find all over the world with very different kind of people. Um, and the trend that I notice nowadays is that the Internet is, from that global level, becoming again more local or regional. Um, we have uh, uh, geo-blockings, we have uh, localization of uh, all kinds of programs, and I'm coming from, from a gaming community. And, uh, yeah, for example, in games, you're not anymore that much paired up with players from all over the world, but you're always in your own country, in your own code. And um, beforehand, you said that, um, uh, that, that there's the big distance that makes uh, you detach more from the issues. And on the one hand, I have the impression that when I go on Facebook, um, I still get confronted with a lot of global issues that then I also don't care so much about anymore. But the network that is built is still quite local. And uh, it might be a possibility that these local networks then have more effectiveness when it comes to putting it into physical action. Um, and that's why I wanted to ask you if, uh, if you see it. Is, is this localization or relocalization of the Internet, is it a positive thing towards um, activism, towards proper, uh, really making stuff again happen? Or is it a negative thing because it undermines the global nature of the Internet? Okay, can we have quick answers for this? Anyone? Um, uh, to answer you, I'm going to draw on what Amelia said about the internet, well, enabling people that are detached to actually um, engage or feel relatively engaged. But there's um, there's a big worry. You mentioned the Kony video that went viral on YouTube. I'm from Uganda. And I can tell you that that video caused quite a lot of stir in the country. First of all, because it was misinformed. Connie has not been in Uganda for a very long time. Uganda is not in, the cent in Central Africa. It's in East Africa. But, but people were educated by this. Very many youth, very many people that felt that, oh, we, we, we care about these people in this remote part of Africa. But th that was wrong information. And they could have uh, been able to get more accurate sources or participate better or contribute or support the cause of these refugees or post-conflict areas in better ways that are not internet enabled or that are internet enabled but uh, more accurate and yeah more reliable than what the internet and is an answer to of. the local global discrepancy Again, that's that's the same thing because this was an internet made. Sorry, this, this was a video made by an, an, uh, a global NGO uh, for, for a developing country and marketed in the Western world. So again, it's misrepresenting, it's misinforming. So the discrepancy remains. So the people in the Western world are still not aware of what actually is happening in the other part of the world where people don't have internet. They are not even watching this video, yet they're making it for them, if that's making any sense. Sorry. Okay, did you want to... Pose a question. Uh, 
Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I think uh, the dialogue which you are making about, I'm Parminder from an NGO in uh, India, IT for Change, about what's the nature of society before and after the internet, right? That's, that's the dialogue. And it, I think, has to be done in two or three categories, and they should not be collapsed. Uh, and I would leave one category dialogue out. I just want to say the other two categories and go out of the dialogue, perhaps listen to it. We may focus a lot on individual uh, relationship to the internet, which is very fine. I mean, each of us has a right to have a relation to that internet and describe it. Right? But since we are in a political space, there is a meaning to certain kind of representations and absence of other kind of representations. Now, I and you said give your backgrounds. I and your age. I'm 47, used the internet first in 2002 for a public purpose and was using it for a public purpose. I was embarrassed that I couldn't type it on and then I said I should also learn it uh, and I started learning it. We come from an organization which very clearly says we don't represent ourselves. Now to be frank, uh, if I was not doing the work I'm doing, I wouldn't be a part of this discussion and I watch a movie or go somewhere else because I'm really not interested in uh, much in how internet is changing my life. 20 years back also life was pretty good. It has some goodnesses today. I mean, I'm, either way, I mean, it's a personal opinion. I completely agree with somebody who's very motivated, fascinated with what happens today. But I personally am happy, I was happy 20 years back also. However, my interest comes from what internet is doing to the world, how it's redistributing power, and then I'm here on a representational basis. So those two issues quickly. One, when we go to the individual relationship with the internet, we miss the collective. Sometimes the individuals together don't make a collective. There's some things happening to the collective systems which don't get caught by our individual narratives. And related to it is the structural issues, the structural changes. And I heard you say there's at least something and not more. And we take it in a linear, it's like a quantitative, it could be 2 or 8 or 18, but we don't take a forked path. There are many different alternatives. We don't have the counterfactual of what may have been. Everybody says Facebook is great. Aren't you happy? I said, I'm happy, but it's not somebody owning the Internet's uh, innovation. It's public, and it could have been different, and I want that one. And they said, you're stupid. They were against the Internet. No, I'm not against the Internet. But there is a counterfactual, and not enough people build that counterfactual. They do build in an areas like freedom of expression, where there's some people more interested than others, but not in redistribution of political, social, cultural power, where there's not many people uh, talking about it, and somebody has to be making the counterfactual. So I'm just saying that the, how the, the society is changing with the internet has many categories, and I'm very happy the dialogue here perhaps focuses, because we have to have a focused dialogue on individual relationships to the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so during many of these, well, short, short speeches, we've had references to how things were done before the internet. I mean, it, things are still face-to-face, -face, used to use paper, we still use paper, and so on. So, uh, would panelists perhaps be able to give some sort of good examples, perhaps from their life? Um, what should the digitally native, I mean, young people or people who have, just people who have been using internet and ICD for a long time, what could they learn from how things were done before? Is there something that we're simply doing wrong now? Do you have an opinion on that? It seems to me that although, yes, I was giving an individual point of view, in fact, several of the things I've said, other people who were speaking more generally or institutionally, said the same thing. The, the issue of speed. It used to be slow, uh, at least. You used to have time to think about it. You used to have time to decide. One of the things that's... I'm, I'm not answering your question. After which, Remind please. me of the question. <laughs> uh, do you think that people now could learn something from how things were done before all of this technology. Okay, I am answering the question with a question. We've heard a lot in Azerbaijan about freedom of information, but I'd like to ask you about a freedom that I haven't heard anybody mention at all, and that's 
freedom of choice. Do you still have freedom of choice? Are you referring to perhaps the pressure that technology that is more and more prevalent sort of, uh, well, it forces you to be online and reachable and everything. That is a point that has occurred and has been pointed out many times in the dialogue. Anything you want to add? Anything you wanted to add? Well, just... Do I have a right not to be on Facebook? All right, uh, first over there. You can use this microphone here. Thank you. Um, I want to make a very brief comment that, if you can hear me here. Yes. Um, the, the use of the term digital native, I am older than most, well, at least half of the room, maybe more. Um, but I was involved with the very development of the Internet in the, uh, as, as we know it, the Mozilla, Netscape, the whole thing. I lived through that. And the term digital native, some people seem to think that that means that people are sophisticated when it comes to the technology and the use of the technology. From my observation, digital native is just somebody who takes the technology for granted. The same way that Germany was one country, the Internet always existed. And I think that there's a big difference. We need to differentiate. People who take something for granted didn't have to work for it, and in many cases don't have a sophisticated uh, view of, of, of what's going on. Uh, when, we, when we talked about um, the, the last and change people, well, on Facebook or, or clicking like or something, I think that, that it has made people young, young people in, in particular, impatient and lazy. So it's easy to quick like, I've done my job, I've expressed my political opinion, and I can go back on Facebook and tell everybody I had the best cappuccino and, you know, I feel like a million dollars. But revolution takes time to plan. It's not something that happens like this. And it takes concerted effort. And this is something that, that I, I have four children. Age, range range from 5 to 16 and it's much harder for me to see the to develop in them the idea of concerted effort for us to write a research paper we went to the uni we went to the library and we had to find the books and photocopy and take notes and so on and now everything is at our fingertips and it's just copy and paste copy and paste try to change the words so it's not plagiarism and hand it in and so I, I really think that that to I, I don't know how we instill in young people but if you want to make a significant political change you need to take time you need to plan it because getting everybody together in Tahrir Square for one day does not change the politics of a country well said well said uh, I'd actually like to hear yeah if you can add to also to the uh, point to the, let's say... I mean, I, I don't have much to add, but I'm quite frankly, many people now don't have a sophisticated view of what is going on. What do you ask of people? That they know the specifications for the UMTS protocol? Maybe they have a sophisticated view I, of something else. Like I, I, I don't think... I, I think that being able to drive a car is completely different from being able to build a car or repair a car. And people don't need a sophisticated understanding of the technology. But sometimes people use the term native as if these people understand the intricacies of TCIP and so on. They care, many of them, unless they're engineers, they just grew up with this as uh, the air they were breathing. And, and there's a difference between taking something for granted and being sophisticated in its, in its development, its technology, and its use. So um, if I can again then come back on this, I think this is connected to what what, what um, you said, um, whatever that was, and what also the gentleman, the gentleman from India, who who addressed actually the social changes, um, because I think we take the technology for granted, but maybe there's actually a very large social impact, and I would connect the digital native more to actually uh, a social aspect. When you're a native in a country, for instance, like 
I, I grew up in Sweden. I am very shaped actually by my childhood in Sweden. I am not nothing if not the product of my upbringing, just like many other people are the product of their upbringing somewhere else. And I think that we need to see the digital native concept or digital citizenship as something about the way that we relate to each other in the global, in the global network. Right? It's not about us having a sophisticated understanding of how the Am Amsterdam Internet Exchange reroutes our traffic over the transatlantic cables. It really doesn't matter. The only thing that is essential in the end is that I can speak with my friend from Romania when she's in California at whatever time of the day that I choose. And how does this affect us and our friendship and what we do together and how we can enable ourselves to create um, a, a change? Um, I, d I don't think we are disagreeing I, on this I point. I take issue with a very technological, like the very technocratic uh, view, but I very often see that also. I mean, in the European Parliament, very often you will find people also coming in, both from civil society and from the lobby groups, and they're like, listen, these intricate economic relationships actually between the large telecommunications providers that want to control our communication flows and the end users that want to decide for themselves, um, this actually is a highly technical issue, which is extremely complicated. Legislators should stay away from this, because with these technological distribution mechanisms of financial power, surely the legislator could not have any precedent for acting upon this. And it's like the, the, the technocratic view risks... Um, risks taking focus away from social issues that I think we need to address. Um, and again, I, think we, I, I think we are saying the same thing. I think that, that understanding the technology is not what it's about. I'm afraid that some people use the term to mean that, and then it confuses the conversation. Yes, apparently the uh, term digital native is a bit, is a bit fuzzy. Uh, John had something, and then Ashna. Yeah, I just thought I would say a couple of non-technological things to respond to what you're saying. But I mean, I, I, I do think, I, I completely disagree with you in, in the respect that it's a problem that, that relates to young people. I think it's a universal problem, this question of focus and attention um, and the dangers of multitasking uh, in activity. And uh, a very good friend of mine, a film director, said to me something a couple of months ago over a coffee, which literally, he said it changed his life. Somebody had told him and uh, suggested I did it, which I did, which is never allow technology to interfere with you when you are in motion. In other words, when you walk, uh, never look at your phone. Never answer your phone, never look at emails, do a text, whatever. If somebody calls you and you need to take the call, then you stop. Um, and it was brilliantly simple. Um, and what it allowed me to do was actually to look at things, buildings, people, not break my ankle when I'm walking uh, or walk in front of a car or whatever. And it was amazingly transformative. And uh, myself and my um, two daughters who are both uh, in their teenage, uh, we've, and, and we've come up with all kinds of interesting rules about navigating, about being masters of technology and not slaves of technology, such as no computers or telephones in any room where we are eating. Um, which is brilliant. It is abs and they love it, and they do it, and they it was their idea. In other words, um, you know, if, if you're with somebody, I mean, if, you're, if you're on your own, that's completely different, but you're with somebody and you're talking to them, then nothing should interrupt you, nothing should get in the way. And the kind of quality of, uh, of that engagement. And one final thought, because I, I talk a lot about sort of one step forward, one step back with, it is absolutely uh, wonderful. Uh, as, as Emilia said, to, con to talk to, to a Romanian in the United States or talk to a, you know, a Spaniard in, in uh, you know, Zambia or whatever. It's, it's all wonderful. There is a n negative to that, and that is, um, again, back in ancient history when I traveled as, as, as a teenager, I had no technology. I had no telephone. I was eight months in India, and I twice phoned my family in eight months. And they sent letters through old sort of sticky letters that were sent to the forwarding post office to where blah, 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 all those old things that, that only older people would know. And I, now, wherever I am, I, you know, I look, at, I look at how Chelsea are performing their latest game, wherever I am, you know, or I, you know, looking at uh, what the latest tweet about something. Completely. And what I think it does, it's brilliant for connectivity. What I do think it does, I think it... Um, makes your relationship to your new environment more shallow. You actually, so if you are in India and you're chatting with your friends, you're blogging, you're doing this, you're doing that, whatever, 
uh, you're looking at the football results, you're catching up on the latest gossip, or even watching a TV program from home, or whatever else, you're not actually in the country that you're in. If you've got nothing else to detain you, you immerse in a completely different way. I'm an optimist. I think everybody, whatever age, is actually beginning to navigate those things. And if you don't want to, if you want to immerse, just go immerse, just switch things off. Put an out of office or whatever, you know, you, you, you call it an identifier on your email, just saying, I'm not going to respond for the next month, right? If you're travel, right? And then, you know, what are people going to do, right? Only give a certain number of people your phone number and, and say, you know, what, you know, text me urgent and I'll call you back, right? And then that's it. I, I'm just saying that there's, uh, technology can entrap as much as it can empower, but I don't think it's a young person's problem. Uh, first, before asking that, you, did you have something to ask yet, yeah, sir, over there? Quickly, please. Hello. Okay, my name is jo Jose from Mexico. I'm working creating math videos for Latin America, and I love the videos on YouTube. Right now, I have more than 27 millions of views. So it's the first one in Mexico, and maybe the third one or the second one, biggest channel on Latin America. And I am doing all this because I'm worried about the education of my... I'm from Tijuana, so Tijuana is border to California. And we have many pro problems in our location. So for me, math uh, gave me a lot of things. Principle, uh, I have um, I have been traveled in into different cities in my country. I before for, um, I know during I I got involved in Olympiad mathematicians. Uh, I think that is a feel that you have to think a lot and you create a logic that you can solve many things uh, instead in the school they teach you process and systems so maybe uh, that's why i started to upload videos about how to solve problems not only process to think but after two years uh, i i, I wonder maybe it's not only necessary to start in just posting videos about class or logic so the students they need to see the math not only as a uh, in numbers or equation they have to see the math to think different so we can see right now many example from artists musicians and also we need this kind of people in our cultures uh, so that's what that's why we uh, well I went with, uh, with my government, because they have a channel on the cable, they broadcasting over my city, and I spoke with them, could, could, we, could we pass all the videos that we have online to on the TV? They say, okay, let me think about it, because there are many things, paperwork that they have to do. I spent waiting six months, and later they called me, okay, you can do it if you want, okay? Okay, so I started doing it for free, they give me the opportunity. I I produce everything. Well, my wife and I we are only two, and we produce and we have right now like six months. Uh, you know, some people is changing. You know, with the the TV any channel and they stop because they saw equation. The format of the videos is a small whiteboard, and my hand is only writing and speaking. You never are. I'm gonna see me on the videos only my hand. Um so the people later they they meet me I don't know some places like events that when, when I show my work and they say oh you helped me to continue my studies because before the I didn't know how to study I was always af af afraid of math uh, I stopped my studies and and I finished my high school I finished my university so right now we have like more than 1300 videos and we are continuing our goal is um to have all the math basic from elementary to high school maybe later from uh, could okay. you keep it a bit shorter now sorry ah. could you keep it a bit shorter now uh, okay yes i'm going to finish well at the end of, of the day i would like to just to say that the internet helped me 
to see a, a normal class to different class because in the class you don't have many opportunities to dedicate your time, your attention to each student. Even each student, they have different way to think. So this helped me to change the way to teach and also the student to learn. Okay, so there are completely new methods for education available. Yes. Okay, uh, Ashna, you said something. There. Um, uh, yes, um, the, your original question was, of course, lessons of before and after for the youth, and then the gentleman over there stated it to digital natives, and then Amelia made a submission. But I think it all goes back to uh, Deirdre's question, is whether or not you have a choice when it comes to the internet and what you use it for, what enables you, or what it makes convenient. Uh, taking it personal now, I started using the internet after changing from an African education system to a European education system. So that, that's the first time I experienced the internet. And it's not very long ago. I had never used internet in Africa. I only used it when I went to study in London. But um, when I did use it, and when I did find out about Facebook, and when I did find out about Twitter, I chose not to be on Facebook. I am not on Facebook. I am not on Twitter. And I am in the youth bracket, I would like to think. <laughs> so it, it comes down to choice, like Jadra said. Yes, it's a great thing, but do you use it? Do you have a choice to use something else? And if that something else is available, then yeah, it, it comes down to a personal thing. Okay, so uh, apparently this whole topic is way too wide to cover in a one and a half hours or an hour, but uh, since we did start a bit late, I have one more, one more question I want to circle, circle around, and then we can continue questions around. What did you say? Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, one more time, I want to talk about the self-evident. So what have you noticed, both as younger and older people, that some people sell, hold self-evident and that seemed funny or bad for some reason. Because, because pe people who have been using the internet for a long time, they do hold something as obvious. It's not about knowing if you know how it works, but simply that it has always been there. You don't, you don't, you don't really criticize it. Might be very superficial. That that is true. So, as a as a person, uh, for example, who has seen the development, seen how the technology has arrived, okay, I could direct this to Dieter. Uh, what would you see that has surprised you? That okay, this things, this thing is something that these kids are not even discussing. It just is there, and they should be worried, perhaps, or take a deeper look at it. It seems. It seems to me that people are taking for granted, somebody used the language a little earlier, and I'm going to use it again, that they are the slaves of the machine. I refuse to be the slave of a machine. However, I do know that, for example, first thing in the morning when I get up, I stumble into the kitchen, put on the coffee pot, and put on my computer. And I'm beginning to think that my husband doesn't really like that because it cuts communication. I know my dog didn't like it because he peed on my laptop. <laughs> All right, so uh, anything, anything from the panelists you'd like to close up with? Well, so maybe just shortly, of course you are, I mean, um, I don't know if you've seen Life of Brian by Monty Python and that weird guy, the Eremit, who lives in a cave and eats only berries. You have, of course, the option of being this individual also in the digital landscape. You don't have to be on Facebook, you don't have to be on Twitter, you don't have to use StatusNet, free open source alternatives, nothing like that. You don't even have to have an email address. Nobody's going to force you. The reason that you sign up to emailing this sort to Facebook and Twitter is because there's some... I mean, at least for me personally, it would be that I have friends there and that actually I don't object so much to hearing that my sister, for instance, has been to a nice dinner. It makes me happy to know that my sister, even when I'm not in her presence, is able to enjoy herself and that I don't have to worry that she's getting cold feet or, you know, having a cold or whatever. And it, 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 it's, it's, a social, it's a social tool. It defines social networks. You can choose not to define them that way. 
Um, but at the same time, I don't see why we should necessarily condemn the people who do. Um, so, but that said, I recognize this also when you're in your laptop space. You're not in the same space as persons in the same room. And I think it's also important to be able to be in the same physical location as people without allowing yourself to go digitally far away. I would just say um, that I'm an eternal optimist and a believer in progress. And uh, in 2005, my father, who was 82 at the time, um, uh, wrote me his first email. Um, he uh, wrote this email. He then printed it out. He then phoned a, bike, a motorbike messaging company. And then a guy with a helmet came uh, with an envelope um, and a piece of paper. Uh, to my office and said uh, I have something for you that was the first email he didn't realize that he had to press the send button um, so uh, but now he does um, and he's uh, really quite old so um, if an 82 year old can learn and learn how to use it properly then um, I think there is still hope all right so in conclusion we have all this mighty technology but uh, plus one might not just be enough so technology won't do any everything and we shouldn't be lazy with journalism or anything. It's just we should take a more deeper look in things. And let's not, and let's hope that we won't become too passive and too too technology oriented. I suppose it takes a lot, just a lot of time for us to get used to this new new situation where we have where we even use such a word as laptop space. It should be just a tool, right? Okay, topic was huge. I think this needs a lot more discussion and a lot more statistics and data to actually continue. Uh, thanks, everyone.